seven kilos, which is about half my body weight. <laughs> you can see it's pretty maneuverable, but it is heavy. Well, good morning everybody, a very warm welcome to the Royal Armouries. My name's Danny and I am one of the live interpreters here at the museum. So our job is to highlight for you this amazing collection. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the collection just through there on our right, which is the 100 Years War with France. That encompasses quite a few battles, but I'm going to be talking about one battle in particular, which is probably the most famous of these battles, known as the Battle of Agincourt. This happened on the 25th of October, 1415. And it's very, very famous, mainly because of the monarch. So does anybody know what that monarch was? Okay, it's Henry V. Henry V, my favourite medieval monarch. He was quite a boy, was Henry V. He was very popular with both the nobility and the working classes. And he was very clever because he came to the throne in 1412, right in the middle of the 100 Years' War, when support was actually dwindling. But he was able to um, gather that momentum and that enthusiasm and actually raised by taxes with the public a huge, huge army of about 15,000 men. Now, Henry himself, quite a character, okay? So he would have been wearing armour like this from a very early age, training in the arts of chivalry, swordsmanship, horse riding, and he was actually reputed to be able to vault onto the back of a horse in full armour. So obviously a very fit guy. He was also a very respected military leader. So at the young age, the young tender age of just 16 years old, he was actually fighting with great courage and honour and actually leading from the front at the Battle of Shrewsbury. Okay, they were fighting the, uh, the, the Welsh under Owen Glandur and he was leading that battle on behalf of his father, Henry IV. And it was during this battle that Henry actually took an arrow right through the cheek. It went all the way through and lodged, lodged into the base of his skull. Luckily it missed the brain. He carried on fighting and his own surgeon was able to make a tool that actually removed this arrow a few weeks later and miraculously he survived. But it did leave him quite disfigured. So if you ever see a portrait of a medieval monarch that's in profile, that is to say sideways on, it's Henry V. All the other monarchs are depicted straight on Henry's from the side because he was left quite disfigured. The upshot of this scar was that it made him quite a formidable character, a well-respected military leader. So the Battle of Agincourt itself. So I could talk about the campaign as a whole, but actually there's a man in history that probably puts it a whole lot better than me. And that man is, of course, William Shakespeare and the famous play Henry V. Now, Henry V starts with what we call a prologue. It's quite common in Shakespeare plays, no different in Henry V. And this cloaked figure, I'm not in a cloak today, obviously, because of the armour, but comes onto stage, and what he does is he sets the scene. You've got to remember that in Shakespeare in England, on the globe stage, they wouldn't have had elaborate lighting, basic, basic props, some basic costumes, but it was all about the storytelling element. So this guy comes on stage, and sets the scene. So what I'm going to do for you now is have a go at doing that prologue for you. All right. Now obviously it's Shakespeare, there is some difficult language in there, but I hope that you get a sense of it, because it's actually quite poetic. So here we go. Guy comes on stage. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. A kingdom for stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the wall I carry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hands, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden urn the very casks 
that did affright the heir at Agincourt. Oh, Paul, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us cyphers to this great account on your imaginary forces were. Suppose within the girdles of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose high, upreared and abutted front, the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts, and into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of forces that you see them, hmm? Prince in their proud hoofs in the receiving earth, for it is your thoughts, your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Carry them here, there, jumping on the times and turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me, chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to think and kindly to judge. Our play! And so the play unfolds. And it actually resembles what historically happened too. So Henry V sets off, sets off with about 700 ships from the port of Southampton and arrives at a place called Harfleur, which is a, a, a kind of a port town on the north coast of France. Modern day it's called La Havre, okay? and they siege the castle of Harfleur. And it takes six weeks, and Harry, Henry actually uses cannon very, very effectively, and eventually breaches the west wall, and that's where the famous line uh, in the Shakespeare play, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, comes from, it's that breach in the west wall. And finally, the French surrender to the English forces, but it takes about six weeks. And we lose many of our troops to a nasty disease called dysentery, Dysentery is kind of a bacterial uh, thing that can kill you. In, in medieval times there was no antibiotics, so a lot of people died. He then left a garrison at the port of Harfleur. So by the time he decides to go on this march through France, his force is depleted from 15,000 to approximately 7,000, about half his original force. All right, but what he decides to do, Henry being the king that he is, <laughs> is he wants to march through Normandy. He is the Duchy of Normandy. He believes it to be his birthright. Why should he listen to the French? And he marches along the north coast of France, heading for Calais, which is still an English-owned port. All right? And it's kind of, a, 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 a kind of an affront to the French. He actually issues a one-on-one -on -one challenge to the Dauphin, who's the Prince of Blood, the French would-be king. But unlike Henry, who's this brilliant military leader, the Dauphin is a, in the words of Dan Snow, a fat, corpulent, lazy muppet, all right? So of course he turns down the fight, and instead this French army begins to amass. And actually they manage to get ahead of the French army, forcing the English to turn inland and head down some river looking for a crossing. Finally, they arrive at a battlefield known as Agincourt. So a tiny village in the north of France. It's about an hour away from Calais, and they block their way home. On the eve of the battle, the English army are feeling very, very dejected. Their numbers are depleted. It's a rainy October day, so they're in bad spirits, all right? They're heavily outnumbered by the French. They think they're all going to die. By contrast, the French are in good spirits, well fed, Many of the young princes of the blood want to earn their spurs. They want an opportunity to fight the English in open combat to win their spurs. Take hostages, ransom, and be the heroes of the day. And they really believe that they're going to win. And what happens on the night of the battle, in the play, is that Henry walks amongst his army. He gets a sense of the mood, and he realises that he's going to have to pull some real leadership skills out of the bag if he's going to get these guys to fight. So, you imagine that you are my war council, you are my nobles, my dukes, my earls, my knights, the top echelon of the English command. And what happens, Harry comes back from this walk around his troops and he enters this tent and he hears his own cousin, that's going to be you so today, you don't have to do anything, I'm just going to use you as a reference point. So you are going to be Westmoreland, the king's own cousin. And he hears his cousin basically say, 
Would that we had but one ten thousand of those men in England that did no work today. And in modern terms, what that basically means is we are desperate for more troops, we are all going to die. And this is Henry's response. It's a very famous speech, so I hopefully you'll, you'll recognise it. <clears throat> What's he that wishes so? My cousin, Westmoreland. No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. But if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honour. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. But rather, proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host. That he that hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put it to his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us this day. This day is called the Feast of Crispy. And he that lives this day and come safe home, will stand at tiptoe when this day is named, and rouse him at the name of Christian. He that outlives this day and sees old age, will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbours and say, oh, tomorrow is St. Christian. Then will he strip his sleeves and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Christmas day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. And then shall our names, as freshly remembered in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford, Exeter, Warwick, Salisbury, Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembering. This story shall the good man teach his son and crisp and crispianian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembering. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he now so vile this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abet shall think themselves a curse they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, while any speaks who fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day! October 1450, morning of the battle, nobody knows how it started. It could have been a ranging shot from a lone English bowman. It could have been an overzealous French prince of the blood kicking his horse on and charging down that hill at the English line. Nobody really knows. What we do know is that absolute carnage ensued. Now I want you to picture this. Probably we think about 15 to 20,000 French. Now, obviously, they wouldn't have all charged at once, but the front line, the first wave, probably 500 to 1,000. Heavy horses on a hill, armoured horses with knights dressed like this, charging down the hill at the English line. Now, Henry was very, very clever, and he'd chosen a position where there's trees on both sides. You'll see that from the diorama, which I really want you to go and look at after this talk preventing that cavalry from charging around the back, which was the original French plan. So he said they're charging down the hill. Now you've got to imagine, up to 15,000 arrows in the air from the 5,000 English bowmen at any time, all right? They reckon they could put one every six seconds into the air. And it would have been, you know, I ride horses and trust me, horses do not like noise. You imagine, 15,000 arrows raining down on you. It would have been absolute chaos. Riders being unhorsed, um, horses charging back into the line of uh, uh, foot 
soldiers, armoured foot soldiers, French that are coming forward. It would have just been like the Battle of the Bastards in Game of Thrones, where you just get bodies piled up in thick, thick, foggy ground. All right? It would have been absolutely brutal. All right? Guys in full armour being pushed into that mud further and further. The archers that were lightly armoured, lightly armoured, picking up their mallets, their hammers, their daggers, coming up, kneeling down, finding the cheats in the armour, the visors, and literally driving those daggers down into the French knights. Absolute carnage. So you can imagine what it was like. At the end of the battle, remarkably, only about 300 Englishmen lay dead. And only two nobles, we think, which was the York and Suffolk. They were the only two nobility. Everybody else were, were lower classes, the archers. On the French side, we think probably about five to 10,000 is a rough estimate. So it was an absolute whitewash. And it will live on in history as being one of England's greatest, greatest battle honours. So that's Henry V for you. What I'm going to do now, obviously after this, go and look at the collections we've got, the diorama, the armours, the swords, it's all over there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a mail up the front, a sword, and this is what we call a hound skull bassinet. You can have a look at that and you can just get a sense of the weight and what this would have been like to wear on a boggy, marshy, 14, 15 day in northern France. Other than that, thank you so much for your time. Hope you enjoyed it.